So through the month of January, December, uh, during the Advent, our, our focus was uh, God's love is born in us and how we live that out and how God's love reigns out in various ways. Prior to that, we were in a series called The Seven Pillars of Our Faith, and we did five of those pillars before Advent, and we're going to do the other two pillars this Sunday and next Sunday. So how many of you here can remember what the first five pillars are? Okay, we'll start over. <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do the first pillar today, and we'll do... No, I won't do that. I would encourage you, though, to, to, to try and jot these down and remember them, because I think it's, if it's a pillar of our faith, we really need to understand what our pillars are and what they look like. The first Sunday, we talked about who God is and what God represents and how God created us, and He has a plan for us, and He has a plan for our world, and He loves us, and He cares for us. And so we talked about who God is. The second week, we talked about who Jesus Christ is, that, that Jesus is fully divine. He is God. He's a part of the Trinity, and He's fully human, and He came to this earth to die on a cross and resurrect from the grave, and He lived a life that can be modeled, and, and we can copy and be a part of our life, and it's powerful the way He modeled all of living for us. The, the third week, we talked about the Holy Spirit as being a gift from God to guide us and lead us and comfort us and to fill us so that we can live out what God has called us to. It's, it's a part of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when we have this three-in-one within us, it changes our lives. And then we, we talked about the Word of God or Scripture, and we talked about Scripture as being the Word of God. It is useful, it says in First Timothy, it says, it is useful for, tra- uh, for correcting, for teaching, for training in righteousness, so the man or woman of God may be a thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, the way you live out the Master's plan is to know the Master's plan. And when we know what God's Word says, when we know what it means, then we can begin to live it out and we can make it be a part of our life. We we talked about who we are as humanity and what God has for us. And we, we talked about the fact that we are created in the image of God. And in the image of God being in that created in that way means that he, he loves us and He cares for us. But we're also, we have a sin nature that needs to be confessed and redeemed. And Christ did that on the cross for us. And, and so we talked about the fact that God invites all of humanity to come and be in a relationship with Him. Not everybody chooses to do that, but He invites us all to come and He loves us. Today we're going to talk about salvation and what is salvation and what it, how we live it and how we're a part of that and how it's a part of our life. And next week, Pastor Brad is going to talk about eternity, what we believe about heaven and hell and how it's both their very real places and God has a plan for us to be united with Him forever and ever and ever. So today we're going to be talking about salvation. I'm going to start off with reading a passage of Scripture from Romans chapter 6. And in Romans chapter 6, starting with verse 15. Now, the book of Romans is really a beautiful book. It's about, it's kind of Paul's thesis, uh, Paul's thesis of theology. How do we live our life and what does it mean to be a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ and, and how we can make it a part of our life. And in the first part, he talks about the fact that when we are living under sin, we're really dead. In other words, there's no life in us. Nothing is happening. It's, it's really headed nowhere fast. But we are alive in Christ. And alive is, is really exciting. You know, like I, I think of, uh, when I think of things that are alive, I think of, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of like some of you are. So like I like to take a frying pan sometimes and get it really hot. And I like when you drop things on the frying pan that's really hot and you see things kind of dance over the fire, the the, the the hot, you know, you ever do that? Like you drop butter and various things on there. It's like, it's like dances all over the skillet. It looks really alive, you know? Like when I was a kid, I tried to make frog legs look alive. We would put them on a hot frying pan and watch them expand real quickly. And if you propped them up just right, they would jump out of the pan. It was really awesome. But then they would just lay there. So they look alive, but they're really dead. That's kind of what we are without Christ. We can have a movement, but there's no life to it. But with Christ, there's a lot of movement. And so Paul talks about in the first part of chapter 6 that there is no life without Christ. But after Christ comes into our life, there is life. We're alive. And then he talks about, he says, now I want to talk to you about what does it mean to be a slave to righteousness or a slave to a right relationship, a right standing with God. And he describes that starting with verse 15. 
What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law or under grace? Now, let me... One of the things that was happening is the Jewish people were moving from being under the law, which they could not follow all the laws. The law did not save them, right? So, so let me ask you this. How many of you here are law-abiding citizens? Like you follow all the laws of the United States. The answer to that is, is dude, you have no idea. We have hundreds of congressmen in Washington that are trying to reinvent and make up new laws, work with new things. They don't even know what they are. So they got a staff of people telling them what they're trying to decipher. You know, they, they can't, I mean, if it was so clear, we wouldn't have to have all these people trying to make new ones. And, and then, they, then they realize they made a mistake with one they made before, so they make a new one to try and correct that one. It's confusing. Well, in... In Old Testament law, the people got to where they felt like they couldn't even follow all the law. They were confused. It was difficult. And they were never measuring up. And so Christ came and said, you're now set free from the law. And so Paul is addressing, how do we deal with the law in our own lives? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as a slave, you are slaves to the one whom you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness. So now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness." When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at this time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so what Paul is talking about is this salvation thing, this salvation piece, is really God's free gift to us. Salvation is God wanting to invite us and bringing us back to a relationship with Him. He wants us to relate to Him as His sons and His daughters, and He wants us to be in a right relationship with Him. It, it, it's God's free gift to us, but we got to accept it. we got to take what He has given us and say, yes, I want this to be a part of my life. And, and, and people... We, we need to understand as a people that, as we talked about back, we talked about humanity, is that we are God's focus in life. He wants to be in a relationship with us. He didn't create us to say, now I'm going to drive you away from me, but he wants to invite us and he wants us to be a part of his life. And salvation is what bridges that gap. Salvation is God's gift to us. You know, see, all of us as human beings, we're marred by sin. And sin separates us from God. And then Christ come along as the perfect sacrifice and brings us together. So what is salvation? Salvation is God's free gift to us. A verse I just read from 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 2 says it like this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God's prepared in advance for us to do. These coats, you know, these coats and these shoes, if, if we're only bringing them and dropping them off to do our work, we're really missing the point. But the task for us as believers is that we are to help further the kingdom of God. We're to help grow the kingdom of God. And so these coats... There's some really nice coats here. These coats and shoes as we give them really are a tool to further the kingdom of God. You know, it says in, in Luke chapter 3, the John the Baptist says, feed the hungry, clothe those that need clothes. That's, that's part of our task. But we do it with the purpose and the intention of spreading the message of hope and salvation to our world, to spreading that message that God wants to restore us into a right relationship. So as it says in Ephesians, we have been saved through faith. It's not by our works. It's not by our actions. It's nothing we can do. It's by God's gift to us. And then, in, then when that happens, when it comes into our life, it changes the way we live our life. 
John 1 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. In John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And if you know me, you know my Father as well. And from now on, you not only know him, but you have seen him because of me. Titus 3, he says it like this. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the living hope or the hope of eternal life. Galatians, he says it this way. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither is there male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And Romans 5 says, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So it keeps talking about this whole notion of us being saved or us being redeemed, us being restored to that right relationship. And there's really in the scripture, we see these three tenses of that phrase being saved. In other words, it's a past tense that before you and I were born, Christ died on the cross for us. It says in Romans that before the creation of the world, God was having a plan for us to be together. And so there's a past tense of being saved. There's the present tense. In other words, how we are being saved as we live our life today, how God is continuing to restore us to a right relationship. And then there is a future tense, how God is prepared for us even tomorrow and next week and in the future when we meet him, that there's a way that's been prepared for us to be in that right relationship. Let's look at those three tenses just briefly. In Romans chapter 8, he says it this way. Not only so, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. So it's describing there that God already has redeemed us through Christ. And he continues to do that. Ephesians 2. For because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ. It is by grace that you have been saved. It's a free gift. In verse 8, he says it this way, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. He's describing again that whole nature of being saved as a, as a past tense. He talks about it in Scripture as well, of us being saved present tense. Acts 15 the apostles and elders met to consider the question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, my, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God who knows the heart and showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. So what was happening here in this passage is Peter is meeting with the leaders of the church and the leaders were trying to make all the Gentiles live according to the Jewish law. If you want to be a believer, you've got to live by according to the Jewish law. And Peter's saying, no, 
the Jewish law didn't save us. It's not going to save them. It's a free gift that comes from God, and He is working with us, present tense, to justify us, and He's working with us to redeem us, and He's working with us to accept that redemption that comes from Him. It's a present thing that's going on. Romans 10. What does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning the faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's future tense. And then in verse 10, he says, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Present tense. So in one passage there, he's describing both future and present. He says, God is continuing as we live, as we have been, as we will be, God is continuing to pro provide our salvation and provide for us the free gift of salvation. 1 Corinthians 1, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, present tense, it is the power of God. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense unless you are a follower of Jesus Christ. There's that aspect of saved future tense. Matthew says it like this. Brother will betray brother to death as a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Future. When you are persecuted in one place, free to another, flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So in Mark 16, after Jesus' resurrection, the 11 are hiding in a room and they're together and they're talking about things. And Jesus shows up and he talks to him and he says this. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. Here's what Jesus is telling them. Jesus is saying, look, I will give you the tools you need to do the work I have called you to do, and you will be protected. You will be able to get that message out. If you need to speak in tongues, it'll happen. If, you need, if you're bit by a snake, you're going to survive. If you need to drink some poison, you drink something that's wrong, it's going to be okay. I'm going to be watching out for you. The Satan will not be able to destroy the message that is going out. And he says, I will go with you everywhere you go. That, that's a promise even for us today that he's saying, guys, I will give you what you need. Just go to where I call you to go. In John 10, Jesus says, therefore, therefore Jesus said again, verily, verily, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So how do we get there? How do we receive this salvation? Well, we can't get there on our own. We can't get there without God's help. We can't get there unless the Spirit invites us. And when He invites us, He calls us to come and be a part of that. And He tells us, really, there's, there's a simple uh, ABCs of, of accepting salvation. And and if you don't know this or you're not aware of this, write this down. You can use this as a tool as you share Christ with the people around you. A means that we admit that we're a sinner. All of us are sinners that are saved by grace. It says in, in Romans, it says, there is no one righteous, not even one. And then he says a little bit later, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us needs to admit the fact that we are a sinner and ask for forgiveness. And as we ask for forgiveness, he forgives us. In, in Romans 10, he says, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. That's awesome. So, so we admit that we're a sinner. And the second thing is, is we need to believe in Jesus. In other words, put our trust in him as the only hope of our salvation. John 3, 16, a verse that most of us know well. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I think verse 17 is maybe even more powerful. 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. You see, God has a plan for us. And, and when we believe in our hearts and we trust in him, it changes everything. The third piece is, is probably the most challenging piece for most of us, and that is to confess that Jesus is your Lord. As I said earlier from Romans 10, he says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I, I believe that for most of us, the biggest challenge we have is to confess it. In other words, to live it out, to live it on a daily basis, to make sure that those that we interact with, it, it changes things. And I can tell you for myself, uh, a couple weeks ago, it just took a whole new meaning. And I know for many of you, you've thought about it. I, when I sat there that night in my car and, and I saw someone be shot and then someone took their own life and they shot at me in the process, man, as I reflected on it looking back later, it just, it just really got to the core of my being. Here was someone that lived two houses down from the church. I didn't know. I didn't know who they were. I've never, I don't know that I've ever met him before. How can I be confessing my name if I don't have time to stop two houses down and share Christ with them? And, and it really has impressed on me the importance for us to, to make it known, to reach out and to share with those around us. We may be the only opportunity that someone is going to have to get to know Christ. So, so let me in wrap up just share with you, I think, what I believe God is calling us to do. I, I believe that God is calling us to live it out. I, I think these coats and these shoes are only one aspect, one really small aspect of us living it out. So how do we live it out? I think that we take Matthew 28 serious where he says, go and make disciples of all people. I believe that means you and I to go. It, it's not a, if you're feeling like you got a little energy today, which I notice that many of you here are feeling a little groggy. You were up last night watching somebody lose. But God's side always wins. God always is winning. And, and he says that, that we're to go and make disciples. And so we're called to go and make disciples. He tells us in Acts 1.8 that we are called to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He's calling us to live it out, to be a role model. He's calling us with us to share our faith. So how do we do that? Let me just give you a couple of things that I think make a difference. I think it starts, always starts with prayer. I, I think probably the greatest challenge we had here as a church was with prayer week, where we're praying for those around us and we're actively praying for people by name, that God would bring them before us. Because there's that part of us that says, what if they come? Then I actually have to talk to them. What if I talk to them and I don't have an answer to the question that they have? And, and what if, and we have all these what ifs that can paralyze us. It's, it's most easy to live out our faith on the recliner. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, right? It's easiest to live our faith on the recliner because it's comfortable there. We have a place for our cup and we can put our feet up and we can sit back and we can relax and we can take a nap when we want to and the temperature's the right temperature and we can watch a little TV if we want to and we can do all this stuff. But to get out there and actually live it out, it always starts with prayer. And as we pray and as we talk to God and as we interact with God and as we spend time in His Word and we read His Word prayerfully, it lines us up with God and gets us involved with where God wants us to be involved. It always starts with prayer. The second thing then after we spend time in prayer and, and prayerfully reading His Word is it means that we go out and we begin to share it relationally. In other words, we make a friend and then we share Christ with a friend, and we lead a friend to Christ. It starts relationally. We have it, it's called really friendship evangelism. It means that we live it out to be a role model. When someone only observes you and they never talk to you, do they really know what you're about just by observing you? Or can they see you at the wrong time or the right time and be misled? And the answer is, is we need God in us to be helping us and strengthening us and equipping us so that we can do that. And the last piece I think that goes with that is that we need to be discipling somebody. 
Can you name one person that you are investing your spiritual life into? Can you name one person that you're making a difference in their life? And if the answer to that question is no, I would beg of you and plead of you to change that. There should be somebody that you are investing time in and making a difference in their life. You might be the only difference they have. And I could tell you stories of people that I have met and interacted with that they could talk about that one person that changed their life and changed the trajectory of their life. And God calls each of us to be investing in somebody, regardless of your age. There's always someone that wants to hear from you. Stay focused. Keep programming your life to reflect who you are. 1 Corinthians 2 says this, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. And what he's telling us is that with the Spirit in us, we can live out what God has called us to. James 1 says this, this is our last word for today. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Christ came and died on a cross for you, for me, and for everybody we come in contact with and people that we don't come in contact with. He came to change the world. He came to make a difference and invite all of us into that. And I would just encourage you to live that out and be a part of that. Today we're going to take of communion as a reminder, as the first day of the year, that God has a plan and a purpose, and He invites us to be a part of that plan and that purpose, and He wants us to live it out. And, and it wasn't for nothing that Christ died on the cross. It was for you and for me and to save the lives of the people that live in this world. And so this morning, we invite you as believers to join with us in celebrating communion, remembering on this first day of the year that God wants us to live out a lifestyle of representing Him because of what He's done on the cross for us. Let's pray. God, today as we take of this communion, I just pray that you will guide us and lead us and help us to understand the magnitude of what you have called us to. I pray, God, that we might faithfully live it out every day and everywhere. God, when we feel weak, I pray that you would just empower us again with your spirit to faithfully do that. And when, when we're strong, I pray, God, you will just temper us and guide us and keep us focused in the right direction. God, that all that happens will be for your honor, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.